Well, I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Psalms. In fact, I urge you to put a bookmark in the book of Psalms and dwell in the book of Psalms each day while we're, many of us are shut in or more isolated than ordinary. Uh, the Psalms are the prayer book and the song book of God's people. It's a collection of these praises and prayers and songs, 150 of them to be exact, over many centuries gathered by the Old Testament people of God and particularly enjoyed by the early church. Today we read Psalm 127, which is one of a number of songs of ascents. And so I'll read it out loud and ask you to follow along. Listen closely. This is God's inspired and inerrant word. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gates. So in the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Let us pray. O oh Lord, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your word. Soften our hearts, make us teachable. Give us zeal to hear and heed and practice your word. Bless us now this coming week as many will face toil and labor, some at unprecedented levels, while others will be still and we'll wait. Thank you, O Lord, for hearing our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. And let us all say, Amen. Well, don't you just hate to spin your wheels? Have you ever gone on a wild goose chase? It's easy to spend a lot of energy accomplishing almost nothing. And so I guess that's the reason why people call it the daily grind. Or maybe you've heard the nine to five. Or another day, another dollar. Sometimes life seems so vain. And work seems empty. Maybe you've thought about it. We work, we eat, we drink, we sleep, and then we get up in the morning and we do it again. Can the circle ever be broken? Well, here's good news. Psalm 127 says, yes, the circle can be broken. Now, this psalm was written by someone who knows a lot about vanity. Look at the title of our psalm. The title of our psalm is A Song of a Sense of Solomon. Solomon was the third king of Israel. In his day, Solomon was the wisest man on earth, as well as the most foolish. In his day, he was a workhorse. He was one of those Renaissance guys you read about in ancient history. Look at all he accomplished. Solomon constructed the first temple in Jerusalem. This was a seven-year project and it was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. He also built a majestic palace, gardens, roads, government buildings. He gathered thousands of horses and thousands of chariots, and after using them to win the peace, he built up trade. He acquired wealth. He was also a diplomat. He made peace treaties and alliances. And in his spare time, he was a poet 
a prolific writer, as well as a scientist in his own right. His skill in architecture and leadership turned Jerusalem into a showcase city in the ancient Near East, and foreign dignitaries came to view it with their own eyes. Not only did this man have a successful career, this man was a family man, if you want to call it that. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. This man built a family dynasty. But after, toward the end of his life, as he surveyed all he had done in his career and in his family life, this old wise fool wrote the inspired word of Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2 and 3. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he had taken under the sun? You know, those words are very ancient, and they are strikingly contemporary. For even God's people, when we are on pilgrimage to God, on journey to God, to follow the living God, when we're on that journey every so often, we might find ourselves pausing on the journey to catch our breath and wonder, is there any meaning to all of the labors of this travel under the sun? You know, Solomon knew even in his day, that work was an essential component in society. And even though it's essential, it can still be a disaster. One giant disaster, our work lives. One of the earliest examples in the Bible of a work life turned disaster is the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was nothing but an ancient on-the-job injury that OSHA should have stopped. You see, rather than build a building that united, this ancient building project did nothing but divide and shatter and garble human history. You know, the Bible teaches that work, even hard work, can go wrong. Whenever our work deifies people and whenever our work divides us from our neighbors, it picks up exactly where Babel left off. So my question tonight is, can weary people beat the daily grind? Can fallen creatures like me and you ever stop spinning our wheels when it comes to work? Well, tonight's answer is yes, with one caveat if you do it for God, when you do it for God. This brings us to our first point tonight, on the job for God, on the job for God. Uh, open your Bible, keep it open, follow along, I'll read verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. Now, two kinds of work are mentioned in this psalm. Now, I know the ACT career finder says there's more than two kinds of jobs. And if you're a teenager right now taking the ACT, I don't know what they're doing this spring with all of the problems, but if you're taking it, good for you. I hope you can figure out uh, one of, according to the ACT, one of your four kinds of jobs. There are people who like to work with people, to work with data, to work with ideas, and to work with things, four nice qualities. But here, in Psalm 127, our psalm talks about two kinds of jobs. Launching something new and guarding something old. John Stott helpfully points out in his commentary something fascinating. He says this, It is useless to launch a new enterprise, that is, build a house or attempt to guard an old enterprise, that is, watch your city, unless the Lord blesses your work. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're a pioneer or a settler, whether you're an entrepreneur or just an employee, 
whether you're an inventor or an imitator, do your job for God or you will spin your wheels. If on the job you leave out God, all is vain and useless. Building is vain. Watching is useless. You will experience what is described by the Latin motto, Nisi Dominus Frusta. That Latin phrase is the city motto of Edinburgh, Scotland, found on its crest. Stamped on all its official literature, it means, without the Lord, frustration. Ben Franklin was an American printer, author, diplomat, philosopher, scientist, another one of those Renaissance guys of two to three hundred years ago. At the U.S. Continental Convention in 1787, he wrote these words. In the beginning of the contest with Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard and they were graciously answered. All of us were engaged in the struggle, must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. Have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of man. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire can rise without his aid. We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writing that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning. So Psalm 127 says, let's do our jobs, whatever they are, for God. Because the psalm teaches, God works through our work. Now, I know that's not an instinctive way to think. I, I know it, is, it isn't. In fact, I would imagine that you and I, as believers in the Lord, when we go off to do our jobs, we sometimes put on our secular hat. You see, you and I have this notion that if we, do, if we just do A, B, C, D, or if we follow the right technique, or if we learn the correct protocol, then we will flourish on the job. The Bible says no. This psalm teaches that your practical daily work, whether you go out tomorrow to the workforce or you're confined to your home and you busy yourself under your own roof, that work, that daily work that we sometimes call the nine to five or the daily grind, the conditional cause for success in that job is not you, but the Lord. Look at verse 1 again. What does it say? Unless the Lord build the house. It says, unless the Lord watches over the city. God is the conditional cause, not you. You're the secondary cause. God is the cause through you. God is the chief executive. God is, as Aristotle liked to say, the prime mover. The primary calls. Now, before you get too rattled by that, can I say this is no excuse for laziness? You know, the Apostle Paul had to deal with this as he was preaching the gospel throughout Asia Minor in the book of Acts, spreading the gospel. And as he began to preach about the sovereignty of God and God in him and through him and to him are all things. Well, some of the early believers, especially in ancient Thessalonica, thought that since God does everything for us in Christ, 
There's nothing for us to do. And so in ancient Thessalonica, Paul learned that Christians were sitting around. They were doing nothing. They were waiting for the Lord's return. And so Paul saw them living by faith, by being freeloaders and living off the goodwill and handouts of their industrious neighbors. And so Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians, stop. Here's what he said, literally, 2 Thessalonians 3, 11 through 13. He writes, we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busybodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. And so here we learn that God works through you. God works through me. He works through secondary causes. He is the primary cause of all things working through secondary causes, like me and you. This began way back in the days of creation. Yes, I know God in the beginning created all things himself. We call that ex nihilo, creation of nothing out of nothing. But then God created humanity to work on his behalf and to continue his labor of love begun in the creation week. We see this in Genesis 1.28. It says, God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Not only did God create work for you and I, but the Bible also says God created work and he made it meaningful. Every day in creation, look how God said it. God looked back at his work and said with great satisfaction, it is good. Every day that you and I work at the end of the day and at the end of the week, imitating our God, we can look back and we can say in Christ, it was good. Now, one of the great rewards of working for God is mentioned particularly here in Psalm 127. One of the greatest rewards for a job well done is a good night's sleep. Uh, we see that in verse 2. Verse 2 says this, In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Insomnia is on the rise. Are you following it in, in the news? Maybe you're a victim of insomnia. And I find it interesting that as our nation over the past several de decades has become more and more secular, more and more godless. Maybe they don't like the name godless and say we're neutral, but ignoring your creator is an act of choice. And as America gets more and more secular, more and more spiritual, but not religious, or a nunner, none at all, I find it interesting that good night's sleep gets a little harder to come by. A large number of Americans are sleep deprived. One CNN report put it this way. It says, fatigue is dangerous. A growing collection of research indicates America's sleep problems have reached epidemic proportions and may be the country's number one health problem. We're not sleeping enough. Some of you are not sleeping enough. What happens, mom and dad, when the kids don't sleep well enough? What happens, anyone, when you don't sleep well enough? We are 
miserable. We're irritable. We're edgy. And there's growing correlation with the skyrocketing mental health issues in our generation tied to lack of sleep. One report states, those who sleep fewer than six hours a night don't live as long as those who sleep seven hours or more. Dear church, one of the fruit, one of the fruits of a hard day's work, a good, satisfying, hard day's work done for God is when God grants you grace to lay your head on the pillow and fall asleep. The older they get, the more I like sleep. I'll have to admit, I sort of look forward to the pillow midway through the day and push through for my goal. Dear church, here is a bad formula to remember. You want to remember it as a warning. Frenetic work plus little sleep equals spinning your wheels. God grants sleep to those he loves. One reason is God himself enjoyed rest after the creation week, after his work week. Look at it in Genesis 2, 2 and 3. It's just lovely. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all his work of creating that he had done. God delighted and chose to rest. That's one reason why it's such a blessing to rest and to get a good night's sleep. It's, it's one of the, the, the top five in life. A wonderful blessing, rest. God will help you find it. It's his original. But to do so, says verse 2, you must be his beloved. You must be his beloved. Look at that phrase again when it says God gives sleeps to the one whom he loves, to his beloved. Some scholars think that that phrase is a little Easter egg. Uh, I think that's what we call it now. It's a little unexpected treat inside of some type of video or audio that people in the know go, there it is. Well, there is a little treat there because some scholars believe that that phrase, the one whom God loves, is a hidden reference to Solomon, his hidden signature. A little bit like in the Gospel of John, where there's one disciple who's never named, but the writer of John calls him the disciple whom Jesus loved. Scholars think this is Solomon and his signature. Because you see, in the Hebrew, this phrase is the exact same name that God gave to Solomon in the book 2 Samuel 12:25. There, God called Solomon by the name Jedidiah. And that phrase, Jedidiah, means beloved of God. Now, whether or not this is Solomon's Easter egg and a little treat in this psalm or not, what this phrase teaches us is that you and I must be God's beloved, God's Jedidiah, for our work to not be in vain and for our rest to be sweet at night, satisfied with the work God gave us to do that day. If you are God's beloved, your work is never in vain. It doesn't matter what your emotions tell you. It doesn't matter what others tell you. If you are God's Jedediah, his beloved, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, this week, you will not do a single vain thing if it's done for the Lord. And so what that means is you and I must center on God's love this week and be beloved. Well, what do the beloved and the lover do? They spend time together. If you are to be God's beloved and act like God's beloved this coming week, 
then what that means is you actively trust in him daily and walk with his spirit. And then you look at life through God's eyes, not your own. You choose to follow him morally this week. You choose to live life with with an open Bible and in prayerful dependence and asking him daily to bless your work and then to ask him to give you rest and do it all in Jesus' name, knowing he loves you. You are beloved. You are God's Jedediah. As Paul likes to say in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Then I like 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I often say it to myself, especially when I'm tired. Brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work is not in vain. In the Lord, we work for God. Thus, it's never in vain. Now, the psalmist, Solomon, goes on to apply this wisdom to our home lives as well in the second half of the psalm. He says, not only when you work at work can you work for the Lord, but when you are at home, Do it for God. Do your home life for God. This week, some of you will be doing extra duty home life. More home life than maybe you've done in quite a while, at least since last summer. Do it for God. Let's look at verses 3 and 5. Sons are a heritage for the Lord. Children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. There it is. Build your family for God. Now, many of us already know work can be pretty hard. And what do we find difficult at work? Well, maybe a difficult boss. Uh, maybe you have a stubborn coworker. And so imagine with me, you're coming home and you're ready to escape it all. The demanding boss, the stubborn co-worker, only to walk into the door of your house to be greeted by a difficult child, a rebellious teen, or an exasperating parent or overbearing spouse. Wow. Vanity at work. Vanity at home. Someone once said wisely, you know, families are like fudge, mostly sweet, but with a few nuts. And how about this? You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Sometimes family life feels futile, hopeless, vain. If this describes you tonight, can I remind you one encouraging word about your Savior, Jesus? In his earthly life and in his earthly sojourn, the occupation of our Lord Jesus was a carpenter. In his earthly life, he built houses. In his heavenly life, he is now building our heavenly home. Jesus knows how to build homes. He can redeem families. He knows what home and house should look like and trust your family to him. You know, some of our families are messy. Some of our families are chaotic. Some of us, our family lives feel like they're in shambles or disarray. God in Christ restores homes. Even if it's a little wobbly, even if there are so many walls in that home dividing us from one another, God can restore the home. You see, we know this because the Bible teaches families were God's idea. 
It was God who created the family. It was God who created the first man and the first woman to be with the first man in Eden. And this is what he commanded them in Genesis 1.28. He said it, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And so you see, when what God commands, he equips us to accomplish. It follows that God wants families to be fruitful when he says, be fruitful. But we must look to him. In our daily life, family life can take so long. It's really a long and arduous project growing and doing the work of being family. It's a long, long time. Someone once said these insightful words. You spend the first few years of their life teaching them to walk and talk, and then the next few decades teaching them to sit down and be quiet. That's family life. <laughs> it's a little exhausting. And it lasts a really long time, like from the moment you, you get married or have that first child for the rest of your life. And so I, I can understand why moms and dads with headaches go to the medicine closet and reach for the bottle of aspirin and they read the label and they say, yes, it's true, take two aspirin and stay away from the kids. One commentator, Derek Kidner, says such a, a lovely little phrase about the sons mentioned in Psalm 127. He says this, It is likely that these sons mentioned in Psalm 127 will more than likely be a handful before they are finally a quiverful. There it is, parenting right there. So from our perspectives, family life can seem so long. Progress can seem so slow. And at times, you may think it's vain. It's futile. We take two steps forward and three steps back. It's like I'm digging a hole and the family's around watching and throwing the dirt back in. But from the perspective of God, it's so different. What the Lord teaches in Psalm 127 is that children, when they are raised for the Lord, when they are given to the Lord, that children are amazing resources for God, for church, for society, and for those parents. As expensive as kids are at the front end, they are a fruitful investment into the future. And that's why our psalm uses these wonderful words. Firstly, our psalm, psalmist, Solomon, calls them an inheritance. Children are an inheritance. That's the word God uses to describe the children. So what that means is children don't just inherit from you. You, can I say it again? You inherit from them with many blessings. Secondly, God calls them a reward. Not only uh, they are a reward, notice the Lord doesn't say, now kids are going to cost you. Kids are a cost. No. He says they are a reward. They will reward you. And finally, the last phrase he uses, God calls them an arrow in the quiver, an arrow in the quiver. The kids are the ammunition in their parents' belt. In other words, especially when you're older and they are older, the roles of protection will reverse. And it's a humbling thing to watch but it's also a beautiful thing to watch. Rather than mom and dad protecting son or daughter, they are the arrow 
that protects you. Good, strong, God-fearing children will stick up for mom and dad, especially at the city gate, which is mentioned here in the psalm. Now, in the city gate, in the ancient world, the city gate was the happening place. The city gate was sometimes the place of battle. Of course, that's outside the gate. And the young are defending the old at the city gate in battle. Other times, the city gate was the place where courts and judges settled disputes. And so if mom and dad maybe were faced with a lawsuit and they were called out to the city gate by another neighbor and called out by the judge, well, mom and dad could bring adult children to speak out on their defense, and they will. If you are facing a battle, the blessing of your adult children is when they stand up for mom and dad. If you are faced with a health crisis or a lawsuit, the blessing of adult children is when they stand up and speak for you. Children raised for the Lord, the Bible says, prove an amazing resource in the future. That is one of the reasons it is not in vain. Now, maybe I've been speaking to you tonight and, and you don't have children. Maybe you're not married with children or maybe you are married with no children. Well, the one beautiful thing about scriptures, because we're all part of the family of God, is that in the gospel, you can have spiritual children. We see it all over the pages of scripture. Men and women who adopt spiritual children into their lives, discipling the next generation. You can be someone else's other mother. You can be someone else's other father. Paul was a father figure to Timothy. His father was a Greek. Paul believed in Jesus. You can be a father figure. You can be a mother figure. Never forget that, says the Lord. Children, are a blessing in the here and now and an investment into the future. So let me close with these words. When we do life for God, whether work or family, it is always filled with meaning. But dear church, I need to remind you something. Listen close to me. Listen closely. When you think about your job, when you think about your family, can I remind you that life on earth will never be heaven. Family will never be heaven. Your job, your career will never be heaven. The daily grind still sneaks in to marriage, family, work, career, because there is Something, something broken about our lives. And I need you to be honest about that. What happens is when we're not honest about that, we deify our families and we think family will be the source of meaning, the source of love, the source of purpose, and we idolize family and make them a god and they cannot bear that load Heaven is not here. Here is still vanity. That said, we can still beat the daily grind by looking at family life and work life through the eyes of Jesus, through the eyes of faith in Jesus Christ. And so I urge you this week, as you launch into maybe brand new patterns and rhythms of work that you're simply not accustomed to, Whatever you are called to do this week, would you commit in this worship service tonight to do it for God? Do it for God. He is the prime mover. You are the secondary cause. Do it for God. And it will not be in vain. 
And as you do it for God in your family life, you will see the blessings of the Lord. And you just might find yourself this week beating the daily grind. And let all God's people say, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gift in creating all things and then asking us to labor in this life. Thank you for the pleasure of doing something engaging and intriguing and interesting for you in life. Pray for those this week who will launch out into their workplace or stay home in their workplace. We pray for those who will give care to the young and those who are young, receiving and sharing and caregiving at home. Oh Lord, we know that this week could be tedious for some. This week could be um, frustrating for some. And we ask that wherever we find ourselves that we would focus upon you and that you are working through us, through our situation. Thank you, O oh Lord, for this hope that your word brings. We ask this all in Jesus' name. And let us agree vocally by saying, Amen.